No se vayan, al final les tenemos una gran sorpresa que Dirk preparó para que estén pendientes y se queden hasta el final. Muchas gracias, María Fernanda. Adelante. Gracias, Mirt. Pues muchas gracias a todos por conectarse. Hoy les voy a presentar a Charles McDonald uh, y a Dirk uh, Winans. Um, así que bueno, no quiero hacer muy larga mi introducción. Charles es un diseñador industrial y es muy importante. Tiene una larga trayectoria acá en Chile, pero voy a dejar que él mismo se presente. Entonces, Charles, si quieres eh, encender tu cámara y queremos escuchar de ti un poquito de tu trayectoria y ya adelante con la conversación con Dirk. Muchas gracias. Encantado. Thank you very much for that introduction. I, I think I'll take it on in English now. Uh, I'm uh, Charlie McDonald. I'm from Chile and uh, I'm an industrial designer. I've worked doing industrial design and mainly I do lots of architecture, uh, architectural interiors mostly, corporate interiors and commercial interiors. In uh, corporate uh, environments, I've had to use all sorts of furniture and uh, uh, we've been always looking for new uh, ways of helping people to make the work environment better. I'm, uh, I've had a, a couple of companies for lots of years. One is Procorp and the other one is uh, Contract Chile. Uh, now I have got rid of both of them and I'm quite happy. I'm At this moment, I'm camping up north in Chile. I'm at the beach, so I'm in a caravan uh, doing this transmission. So it's nice to be with you guys. Thank you. Okay, shall I introduce myself? Yep, yep. Okay. So my name is Dirk Wynans. I'm um, the owner, uh, designer, um, actually big boss of the company Extremis in Belgium. Um, Belgium, we are just between uh, these uh, big uh, countries like Holland, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Germany, France and the UK. We just in the middle of that actually we are sort of the buffer zone between these uh, countries. Uh, that's why they established uh, Belgium in 1830, just to be the buffer between the great nations. Um, my father was a cabinet maker, so I was born into wood making. And uh, when I married my wife, when I looked for a wife, uh, I looked for somebody who was the daughter of a metal worker. So um, it's sort of an arranged marriage, which works fine uh, so far. And it gave me the opportunity to work with wood, but also with steel. Now, I'm a trained, um, I studied interior architecture, but already when I studied, it became very clear to me that I wanted to work in uh, furniture design. Um, and I actually, I teach industrial design. So uh, me and Charles, we are just the opposite of each other. He studied as an industrial designer, became an architect. I just started architect, interior architecture, and I became a industrial designer or a furniture designer, which I consider something in between the industrial designer and the architect. Um, so my company is established in 1994, um, and I decided then to make stuff that was not on the market yet. That's also always been the strategy of my company. Um, we can call it the um, blue ocean strategy. That means that you go look for opportunities in the area that there is no um, offering. In 1994, you could find anything in the outdoor market when it came to contemporary design. So that is what I, why I started in that area. Unfortunately, at that time, there was no market for outdoor design. The trend for outdoor design came much later. But anyway, it's all about timing. I was not really a lot too early. I think it was the right time to start in uh, to explore this field. I didn't want to do indoor tables so fast and whatsoever because that market was already completely taken by big, big and good players. 
So we never want to do what is already done in a good way. We always want looking for these areas where we can still make a difference, where we can add some value, where we can come up with uh, very new designs, which also are useful for the changing society. Uh, because society is changing all the time. And certainly in these days where we have all these changes by, uh, by, by technology, by digitalization, and soon by artificial intelligence, I think for us designers, we have to really, really look really carefully on what is changing in society and try to focus on these things to come up with new designs and new solutions for the society. Um, so I have three children. I uh, am a designer, but uh, I also design for other companies, by the way. I'm a teacher in um, the Shanghai Institute of Visual Arts in Shanghai. Actually, I'm responsible for the um, industrial design education. I am a hops farmer. I am a beer brewer. This is my own beer. Cheers, guys. Uh, in, in Belgium, it's now five o'clock and officially I can drink something starting from five. Cheers. You all have to wait a little bit longer, but uh, I can already have a drink. Um, and I breathe horses. And I love sailing, I love snowboarding, I love doing all kinds of outdoor stuff. And I love barbecuing, I love cooking, and mainly, even more, I love eating. Thank you. Thanks, Dirk. Uh, I'd just like to get into a few uh, questions uh, that we could... Uh, so that we can focus what we are doing nowadays and maybe what is inspiring us or where we're getting information for the design. Uh, when we spoke uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. you were saying that most of the information you get is from looking at what people do. And I like you to explain a bit of that, please. Well, um, the baseline for our furniture range is tools for togetherness. So I'm not interested in chairs or tables or whatsoever. I'm interested in watching the interaction of people. And I think it's our my task to try to improve that interaction between people. The furniture we make are just the tools to enhance that, to make that possible, to improve that. So when we start thinking about something new, we will never start thinking about, hmm, let's make a new chair or hmm, let's make a new uh, sofa or something. No, we will start really observing how people interact, how people are together, uh, how these things also change, how people do this in other cultures and so on, to uh, get inspired and to, to uh, make that the basis uh, of a new design. Let me give you an example. Unfortunately, I can't show you the pictures, but maybe um, later on you can you can have a look on our website. We have this furniture piece called Cosmos. Cosmos is a, a big round piece. Nine people can sit there. It's a big sofa. It's it's a chair. It's a table. It's a sunbed. It's shade. It's light. It's everything together. So that's why it's called Cosmos. Like it's a huge universe. The inspiration for that didn't come from design books. The inspiration for that came from me going out sailing. I was a sailor at a very young age. I didn't do it for a long time. And then I went back to the sea to sail with the larger boats. Now, when you get back in the harbor, you park your boat. What happens then? You sit together with all the other people on the boat. You sit together in the cockpit. You open a bottle of wine. You have a little talk and all that. This interaction, we take that interaction and we make this into a furniture piece. If you look at the cosmos, you even can recognize the yacht. The inspiration, however, has played in this, not in an in, in active role, but in the back of my head. It's not something conscious. It's, and that's why I always advise my students to go out, to get inspired by anything, but everything, not just looking at design books and all that, but to go out because inspiration can be found everywhere. So even sailing, even my own hop field was the inspiration for our table hopper. 
Um, the Bistro we have, which is one of our latest designs, Bistro is really inspired by all the people in Paris that are sitting at the narrow um, uh, walk, uh, sidewalks uh, at the streets. People are sitting next to each other instead of in front of each other. Try to sit next to each other. It's really nice because you can, if you're sitting next to each other, then you can comment on all the things you, you are looking at together. You see a beautiful woman passing by. You see the same beautiful woman passing by or a beautiful man or a crazy guy or whatever. So you can observe the world sitting side by side and um, and talk about that. So this is again a tool to make make it possible that 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 people interact in that different way, because with the with the bistro piece, you have no choice. You have to sit next to each other. And so it's not two different chairs. And this is, you know, all these things are not new. Eh? I, I will never pretend that we designed something new. It is all there. My grandparents were sitting in front of their house on a Sunday afternoon with chairs next to each other and talking and people passing by and all that. So it's, it's, it's just uh, going back to the basics of life sort of and, and use that as an inspiration for, uh, for new designs. If you say, I'm gonna design a new chair, well, then probably you're going to come up with a new chair, which will be about a little bit the same as all these chairs that already exist. You will never come up with something completely new. So that's why we go way further. We go to the interaction between people. We, we don't think about a chair. We think about the activity of sitting together. It's completely different. And how could you uh, project that into our way of working nowadays with uh, coronavirus and all that? Uh, how will this affect our working spaces, our working furniture? Uh, could you give us a, a yeah. what you think on that? Well, the thing is that, um, it, in my opinion, and, and a lot of people will not agree, um, in my opinion, Corona didn't change anything. Um, actually, the world post-Corona will be not the same, of course, because there is an evolution going on anyway. Eh? People say, yeah, after Corona, the world will never be the same. Of course not, even without Corona. The world in, in 2021 would not be the same as in 2019. Of course, there's an evolution. In the period of Corona, this evolution went way faster. It was like a time machine. It was a leap forward very, very fast. But all the things that happened were already happening a little bit. We were already doing Zoom meetings and all this. Eh? But suddenly, very fast, everybody became good at it. Otherwise, it would have taken much, much longer. Um, we were working from home already. But of course, now uh, we see, we discovered that, yeah, if you want to work from home, you need a space to work from home. You need to be installed. It's not that easy. It, it also has some downsides and all that. The evolution of the office that we will go to higher quality offices in the post-COVID times, that is also something that was already happening because if we want to make sure that people can perform well, if they, if you want to make sure that people feel well, if you want to make sure that people don't suffer a burnout, we have to work on these working environments to make sure that these people do not lose more energy than they get back. If you lose energy in a higher quantity than you get energy, then that is, um, you cannot, uh, avoid a burnout sooner or later. And this is something that we really have to be careful about because, you know, our lives are quite, quite different than 20 years ago. Eh? You, you and I, when we started drawing a drawing, eh? um, then uh, I had to use a pencil, um, then I had to use a black pen, and it took for ages before the draw this drawing was, was ready. Now. The thing is that our, our, our creative, our mental activity for designing was much more at a slow pace because 
making these drawings was relaxing. It was like, um, yeah, um, how do you call that? What, what, the, do, what do the monks do in, in, in Tibet? Um, yeah, they, they are, like, like a mantra or something? Uh, sort of, yeah. So, so all these, these, these repetitive uh, activities, they don't take a lot of energy. They, 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 they just they put, make your mind in, 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 in a relaxed state of mind. Technology has made us super performant beings. But Charles, with the with the, the tools you have today, with the tools I had in, in, in 20 years ago, I could, I, I'm just saying something, I could take a hundred decisions per day. With the tools you have today, you can take a thousand decisions a day. And this is the big drama. And this is why, why we are underestimating. We think that technology and digitalization is helping us. No, it is helping us with these things that are easy, that are relaxing, that don't put any pressure on us. We became so much performance that now all this number of decisions, number of information we have to absorb every day makes it much more necessary to make sure that, that, that we get energy back. And getting energy back, you can do this in very, very, a lot of different ways. Huh? Uh, you can do meditation, you can do um, the need for meditation is, is, is very high today, but that is just because you and I are not longer drawing with these pencils and all, but that these work is maybe not done by us, but done by other people who are 100 times more performant with their computers than we would ever were with our, with our drawings. Um, may, I may I tell you a small anecdote in my first job? They didn't have the computers, so I was 25 years. And when I wanted to write something to one of my customers, I had to write it on a piece of paper. I have to give this piece of paper to the secretary. She typed that piece of the, 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 my message on, 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 a, on, a, on a typing machine. Then it came back to me. It was full of mistakes. It was full of mistakes because she couldn't read my, my writing. I had to correct it. She typed it for a second time. And then it was okay, and then we put it in the fax machine. Now, how much time did I need to get this one message out? It took an hour of my time and another hour from another person. Today, you do exactly the same thing in five minutes. And that, and, and that doesn't give you more time to do something else. No, you just do more. And you write more, and you're busy with all kinds of other things. And um, we were thinking at one point, that the, the new generation, the young people who are educated with technology, that they would be able to cope with this much better. That is not true. Today, the number of burnouts with people that are less than 30 is, has never been higher as today. So we do have a problem there, and we as designers have to work on this to make sure that we provide the right compensation in city planning, in architecture, in interiors of offices, in furniture design, whatsoever. Um, there's a big role in that for us. The, that gives us lots of opportunities uh, because uh, things are changing. They're changing maybe a bit faster than what we thought that it was going to be. But I think it is for better. Uh, what we are seeing in work environments is that people are uh, willing to go back to the office, but not they're not willing to get back into their cubicles. They're willing to gather with other people. And what they need is a controlled space. They, they, everybody is... Uh, much more uh, conscious of uh, who's near each other and all that and people are taking care but we actually need to get together so I think uh, what we can do some people through technology and us uh, the, the design community uh, can do with architecture and mainly with furniture is very important and I think 
your role there is getting furniture that has to do a quite a big task because it has to be flexible, comfortable, uh, good for interiors, exteriors. Uh, nowadays, ex uh, exteriors in offices are uh, much more looked for than it was uh, some mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, people, people are not very happy to have air conditioning uh, uh, on top of them. Uh, so there's much more use of uh, uh, natural air, if you want. Yeah. In our countries, in which we have a very good weather, uh, you could almost uh, be outside most of the year. I think your weather is a bit more complicated, uh, mm -hmm. but you're, you can see, and you said that at one moment, that people in uh, Belgium are willing to be, if they see a ray of sun, they're willing to come out and be in this exterior. And I think it's important what you can do, not only with the furniture, but with the placemaking. And most of your furniture is not a piece of furniture, but it is like a, a complete uh, space. Yes. Uh, with something on top of your head, uh, around you. Uh, your designs have uh, a lot of flexibility and lots of bits and pieces you can put together to make a very nice work environment that's flexible and comfortable. Well, the, the multifunctionality uh, that I use has several reasons. One of the reasons is that we you should not forget that the amount of people in the world is increasing and that the amount of people living in urban areas um, now already passed 50% worldwide. The UN is expecting that by 2050, 70 to 80% of all people worldwide will live in urban areas. That means that the amount of space per person, per family already today is decreasing every year. The amount of square meters, the average square meters that one family takes is getting smaller and smaller. So we need to work um, um, at, at, at using space in a more sensible way and multifunctionality is one of these, these uh, possibilities. Now, uh, the other thing is that, um, you know, Charles, the, the, the trend for outdoor design started around the year 2000 slowly. This is not a coincidence. This is absolutely not a coincidence because this is the time that we started using mobile phones and internet. Because mobile phones and internet gave us so much opportunities, as I just explained you, made us much more performant. And so we had a bigger need to get in touch with nature again. We call that biophilia. Biophilia is a term that is invented by a guy in, in, in the 80s. Uh, where he says, look, there is an inborn need of humans to be in contact with nature. Uh, um, we are, have been in contact with nature throughout the whole existence of human being. It's only in the last 200 years, let's say, that we are detached from nature. So our, our, our bodies, our genes, our, our whole being is still connected to nature, but in practice, we are deconnected and we live in big cities. You now are sitting on a beach there. OK, you are lucky, but um, for, I'm lucky as well because we are in the Belgian countryside here. Perfect. But a lot of people do not have access to nature in these big cities. And that is something that is increasing. So you have the two things at the same time. You have spaces that are getting less and less um, um, available for, for people. Uh, it's, it's, it's decreasing. And at the same time, there is more need for contact with nature. Because contact with nature is the compensation, the possibility, one of the possibilities to compensate with all the stress and all that and to re-energize, re-energizing by contact with nature. What do we see? We see that students in schools who have no access to natural light perform 20% less. 
20% less students who have no contact only with just natural light. It's only one of the biophilic um, factors, and there are lots of them. Um, uh, offices, offices that are designed um, in, in a biophilic way. So you have uh, biophilia, and then you have, if you use biophilia in the modern built environment, then we call it biophilic design. So if you have an office where you implement biophilic design in all its ways, that is natural light, clean air, airflow, um, the colors, the shapes, the plants, artificial or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, you, you see you see a picture behind me here. There is a, a huge image of 10 meter wide. This is an artificial way to bring nature inside. This is a picture. This is the view I have every day at my house. I'm spoiled. Not everybody has that. So um, biophilic design is something that is not something that, that is luxury. It is a necessity in the future, and every office should have it. It is proven already that today performance by uh, employees uh, are 24% better in a good biophilic designed environment. Imagine, as a company, you have the human cost in a company, and a human cost on an average is about 70%. Of course, it depends completely on what, on what kind of activity you have. But imagine that 70% of the whole cost of your company is the human uh, capital. If you can increase this cost, the performance of this cost, by 24%, then you can spend a lot of money and still have a profit. And that is something that we need to, to, to pass out to all these people that make decisions on, on, um, on office uh, environments, that this is not just a investment to spoil people. No, it is an investment that has a perfect return on investment. It, you, you, you profit from that. And there are other proof because we can play with numbers and you can tell me, okay, 24% more more better performance uh, who, who who can say that okay let's let's get to a, another example a psychiatric hospital a psychiatric hospital where you had a, uh, a situation before they implemented uh, biophilic design and after so before there was a, num a certain number of medication that was used also there was a certain number of times that people had to be restrained, you know, in these in these things that they, they have to be blocked like this. Huh? After implementing biophilic design, 25% less medication, 50% less constraints. This is incredible, you know, you know, the, I, uh, I, I can play with numbers when it comes to to performance of employees in an office environment, but I cannot play with numbers when it comes to patients who take less, who need less medication and who need less uh, restraints. The typical environment that is really badly designed in biophilic design is a hospital. The typical hospital, unfortunately, is not a place where, is not a healing environment. It's a cold, clean environment. You know what happens when you go into a hospital? Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. It's not good, eh? This is not the perfect condition to heal. People heal faster in a hospital where you have biophilic design implemented. So you see that this is something that we have to, to, to start um, thinking about. Uh, we have done that in the past because by intuition, we have all implemented some biophilic design somewhere. Everybody did that. The Egyptians did that. The, the, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright did that a lot in his in his buildings and all that. Um, but now with this knowledge, we can implement that in a very conscious way instead of an unconscious way. And we should use that knowledge, that insight um, to make better uh, office spaces, to have better performance of our workers, to avoid all the burnouts we have because a burnout it's, 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 not, it's not a nice thing to happen. Eh? If, if somebody has a burnout, I know some people had it. It seems that it's really, really not nice to have. 
but it costs a lot of money for the company as well. Eh? It costs a lot of money. All the experience of that person is not available for a long time. All the costs and all that, you have to replace persons and all that. So we have to, we have to, we have to, to, to give this a lot of attention in the future. And as you said, the, the changes are going faster and faster. No, the, the changes will always go faster and faster. They never have slowed down. In history, you see that changes always have gone faster and faster. So for the next 10 years, for the next 20 years, we have no idea what to expect. Eh? We cannot imagine the world in, in five years even. Eh? You, normally, we always make plans for, for the next five years. Also, our company makes plans for the next five years, but we know that we have to go back to the drawing board in two years, eh? maximum three. You cannot make plans for five years anymore. That's impossible. The changes go faster than that. And uh, with this, with the biophilic design, uh, we've had some experiences here and uh, in hospitals, and uh, it's difficult to put uh, plants and a natural environment in uh, places where you've got the, the people are in their rooms or trying to get healed. Uh, but there's something very important. There's uh, these all the public spaces, all the transition spaces in which people come into the hospital or have to spend some time waiting there. Uh, we've had to work with spaces that were uh, maybe they had a correct furniture, but a very bad environment. And we changed the environment and we opened them up and uh, we put some, uh, not too much, I wouldn't say we put very many plants inside, but we put uh, some design that you could feel nature and mm -hmm. uh, uh, trying not to be, not to uh, make a false statement that you're in the countryside, but people would normally w were wanting to get near the spaces in which they felt this uh, green touch, I could say. And mm -hmm. people were there and they passed lots of, uh, they could spend a few hours waiting sometimes, and they felt that time was going by much faster than if you're waiting in a blank yeah. room. And that's also helpful for the people who are inside and trying to get better. So I think there's a good possibility and we've had some cases in which we've put some uh, design into rooms also and people in hospitals hospitals are much more willing to be in these spaces than yeah. in a normal, let's say, environment. But, but Charles, it's, it's not only about the plants. There's so much more you can do. Um, I, I know plants is, is nice and all that, but it starts with colors. It starts with the clothing of the doctors. Why is a doctor in white or in that green? Why doesn't he have something like, like this here with, 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 with nice designs and all that? Also, that helps. Why is, is uh, it's also about the music in the, in the show, the, the place where I'm standing here, always you will hear birds, always. So and now I have in the background, I have the little birds that are, they're not real, they're artificial, but it also helps. Acoustic, acoustic is so important because acoustic is something, the echo you have in certain buildings is not natural. It doesn't feel natural. Um, the airflow over your skin, airflow. Actually, in hospitals, in the ideal situation, every room should have a balcony. Every room should have a balcony. And I assure you, it's a good investment because people just heal faster. They just heal faster. And that's what we want to have. We want to have these people out of the hospital as, as fast as possible. So again, it's a useful investment to make there. Um, I can tell you another anecdote where they wanted to make M MIR scans of children. You know, these MIR uh, things, these big, big, big machines uh, where you have to go through uh, in a tunnel. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, with an awful noise and... With an awful noise, M MRI. 
You know what the big problem is with children? They panic. And if you move, then the whole scan is for nothing. So, uh, the, whole, the whole thing that, that, that you scan, so if the child moves when, when he's scared, you cannot, you cannot have a child lying still when he's scared. It's impossible. So what, what do they have to do? They have to sedate all these young children to take these MRE eye scans. What, you know what a doctor did? Very simple. Huh? He decorated the whole scanner with, he made it like a pirate ship. He made it like an underwater world. He made it like an adventure. The, 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 the doctors were dressed like uh, Captain Hook or whatever. So, because it's terrible that you have to sedate children to have this MRI scan. But that was the only solution. Just by adding color, just by adding a whole scene, just by adding decoration and all that, and just by dressing differently, children were in an adventure, they were lying still, problem solved. It can be sometimes so incredibly easy. Getting back to your to furniture, because we've got an awful lot of, of uh, uh, interesting uh, experiences that we can uh, share, but mainly we can see that you're in like your office, your showroom, and we can see some furniture that is made for outside spaces, but works well in inside spaces. And yes. there's a whole range of different solutions like these uh, things you've got on top, the, like the parasols and all that. Yep. Could you uh, give us a, a short tour through what's been your experience getting the, uh, to design this furniture? And how do you cope with this that uh, you have to be able to increase the uh, amount of people or the amount of space between people and uh, uh, the furniture has to keep on working well. Yeah. Well, first of all, what we are going to do and what will happen everywhere is that all outer spaces that are available will be used. You can already see that in big cities like New York City. Soon, all the rooftops, every available space outside will be used. That is already um, in on our booth at Orgatech um, more than two years ago yeah no three years ago i guess um at, at the boot there we made a so-called rooftop that was sort of reclaimed and made made office space so what we will have we have outdoor working spaces even with monitors and everything with electricity with light everything you need to work outdoors in our company here here even in the belgium bad weather we have outdoor spaces where people can not work there for the whole day, but go there to 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 be there for for a while. We have done a test with the at the LinkedIn headquarters in San Francisco. So we 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 have put a outdoor working space there, and then the people of LinkedIn would go out and and really uh, um, ask people how the how they felt about it. They would look at how much people would use that space. Um, so it was proven that um, the space was was uh, was used much more than the exact same space we did inside. So we had the two things to compare. Um, it was it was fully 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 used. So and that was an experiment to 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 develop further. Unfortunately, then COVID came. So the outdoor working space we were already working on before COVID. It has nothing to do with COVID. But now, of course, it becomes very visible that the more outdoor working space you have, the more space becomes available inside for all the other people. If you can use all the space indoors and outdoors and put people further away from each other, it's good. By the way, outdoor, the, the chance of, get, of getting the virus is 20% lower. That, of course, depends on the quality of your indoor space. Huh? But let's say the average indoor space, you have 20% more chance to catch the virus than outdoors. That's a huge difference, of course. But if we can have part of the people outdoors, part of the people working from home, 
then we have more space available for all those people uh, that are inside. And there is one thing that, that already was very, very, very uh, important, and that is offering safety. Safety in all its forms. People have to feel well. People have to feel at home. People have to feel safe. If the management style of your company is very, very direct uh, or uh, hierarchy, then please keep the cubicles so people can hide from their boss. Uh, that gives them safety in that case. But of course, it will not be nice to go to. Nowadays, I'm asked all the time uh, by clients, by journalists and all that, um, what do you think now about, about the, 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 the future? How, how should the future office look like? The first thing to consider is what is the management style of my company? And that will be the thing that detects, that, that, that will, will uh, direct the, 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 um, the office, uh, um, the, the way you install your office. Uh, we have, we have, we're working a lot in Japan. By the way, hey, the parasols we, we sell in Japan end up indoors 70% of the time. 70, that's crazy, right? In that case, we use we use acoustic acoustic uh, uh, material instead of instead of the, the outdoor material. But it, th again, this is a very biophilic thing. You have spaces, and sometimes spaces are high, which is which is fantastic, which is really good. But if you want to gather, if you want to gather at the table, it is very logical. It is our instinct that we want to have something above our head, that we want to have shelter. If you go back to nature, that is exactly what humans did. If they would sit together around the fire, they would go in a cave. They would look for shelter. This is our instinct, our DNA, which still makes us feel better if we are then under that shelter, under that shade, even indoors. So if you, if you wonder why people behave like this or that, or why you like this or that, just go back, just think back, back a thousand years, and think how people would uh, are were living, or, or go to to own ancient tribes and 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 observe how people in in Asian tribes are still living today. This is exactly the same. Um, so you, the 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 gathering of people, the the importance of the shelter, the. Um, the airflow, the good quality uh, of, of air and all that, the, all these things are, 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 are not new. It's a, in, 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 instead, they're, they're just very, very old, very ancient. Uh, these are all desires that, uh, that yeah. come more, they come more to the surface now because we are under such high stress that this, the importance of all this comes to the surface much more than, let's say, 30 years ago. Yeah, that. While you were talking, I, I was remembering an anecdote that in uh, some corporate spaces or office spaces, we had uh, designed some segregated smoking areas, and normally they were outside. Uh, we tried to have uh, some kind of shelter there, but uh, it was mainly uh, open air, and we put some furniture in it and people started and mainly in the last year people are working in those spaces and now they've uh, pushed smoking people out of these spaces mm -hmm. and, yeah. they, and that's uh, because we hadn't done our job uh, fast enough of making more spaces available with the correct Yep. heating the correct furniture and uh, we had to improvise some uh, furniture for the for outside that could also be cleaned uh, lots of times a day and as we uh, a few months ago we didn't know what a safe cleanliness should be uh, we'd spray it with uh, ammonia and all sorts of things and normal furniture wouldn't resist that no. kind of of treating and uh, so we put exterior furniture that looked funny at first but everybody 
finished working there and with a kind of uh, for parasols or these umbrellas uh, it it looked funny it didn't look corporate but everybody was willing to use it mm -hmm. and uh, i think it's a trend that uh, there's a lot to be done there yeah there's a lot well the thing is that that our jobs uh, the content of our jobs changed dramatically eh? so um let's let's talk about the, the meeting room uh, the meeting room look if if i have a meeting with my accountant um I'm okay with a normal meeting room. Uh, um, the typical thing that you have there, you have to go through numbers and all that. If you want to have a creative meeting, don't go to that same room. It will not work. You have to, I, I strongly believe that we, we need to design our offices more, not for, for each person or something, but for each task. You have a task, the meeting with the numbers, that is that meeting room. You have a creative meeting, that is that meeting room or outside. We have our creative meetings outside as much as possible and we try to provide some spaces there as well of course the weather has to be good and it's not only uh, in our country where it's sometimes too wet and too cold there is a lot of countries where it's also too hot so not every country has the possibility to sit outside all the time but we still want to have the same feeling we want to feel at home we want to feel safe we want to feel as we are in 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 we don't want to feel uh, in in a working environment anymore. That's that's that is that is the only feeling we don't want to have. So there is a, a, a lot of of change there, and the importance of that is is very clear because when whenever we hire people here, when when before I started my own company, I also had some jobs because I also want to have the experience of having a job. Um, the times that I was hired because I changed a few jobs. Um, to learn a specific thing uh, that I needed to, before starting my own company. And you know what, you discussed your salary and eventually your company car, if, if you were lucky to have one, that's it. Most of the time you even, you even didn't see the office you were going to work in. That was, that was a discovery on your first working day. That doesn't work anymore. Eh? When we hire people, they want to see where they will work. They want to see where they have to spend their time, their day. They want to see how the environment feels. And that has become more important than that company car and that brand and all that. I will, I will not say that salary is not important anymore, but still there is a huge shift. If you want to attract the best talent, if you want to attract, and there is a war for talent, eh? everybody wants to have the best people. If you want those best people, you better make sure that your working environment is perfect because otherwise they will not want to come to work to you, whatever you offer them. And that is 100% sure. Yeah, that's true uh, in our countries in South America also. Uh, talents, uh, talented people are difficult to retain. Maybe you can uh, have them for a time, but they won't stay. They're not and they, they yes, but you can't raise the, the, the salary to get them better. No, they, they want better environment, working environment. But uh, Charles, look, I'm, I'm never worried about those people who go after a while. I'm always worried about those people who stay all the time. You know, that's the, because those, those, I know if I hire somebody uh, who's really good, I know that one day I might lose him. That's good. I mean, that is okay. As long as those people uh, don't go away after six months and, and, and while they are there, they, they do their job, it's just fine. I'm more worried about those who stay here because those are not the ones uh, you want to keep. That's a bigger problem for you. I wouldn't know how to cope with those. Uh, <laughs> but that's, it's, it's a big problem. Every company has three types of people. You have those people who do their job. That's it. That's the biggest part. Then you have those people who hold you behind. Every company has that. There is nobody who escapes from that. Every company has some people there who just are negative or bad influence or not doing the job and all that. And then you have another group who really pull you forward, who, who outperform what, what they do. Every, every company has those three. But of course, you can try to make the, the one group who pulls you forward much bigger. 
than that loop that holds you back. And there, is, there are studies about this. And uh, the studies internationally show that Chinese companies have the biggest problem with people who are holding them back. American companies are much, score much better. Uh, European companies are somewhere in the middle. About South America, I have no idea. Uh, but, but, um, but this is something that is quite interesting to, to observe because um, you have this amount of people there and, and, and yeah, um, you want to go forward, of course, but you cannot do that by yourself. You need those people to do that for you. And you want that group of people holding your bed as small as possible. So sorry to interrupt. We have just five minutes to finish up the call. Um, and I don't charge of you. <laughs> I haven't started yet. <laughs> <laughs> I know we can spend like, I don't know, all day long talking to you. So uh, I know that we you have a, a, a surprise for us. So our team is ready to share it. So I don't know if you want to introduce a new launch video that you have well, for us. Well, um, the, the, the challenge is not only designing new furniture, but of course we have to reinvent ourselves in those days, uh, in these days uh, to um, introduce new designs to the market. Uh, we have no fairs. We didn't have Milan. We didn't have Oricatec, uh, Neocon and all these fairs. Didn't happen, which was really, really healthy for my wallet, by the way. Um, we, we cannot Im imagine how much difference this makes on, 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 the, on the profit. Uh, it's a lot. No, we're going to do f uh, fairs in the future. But okay, this year we don't have, now we have to reinvent ourselves and try to find the best way to introduce this digitally. There have been lots of companies trying to do that. Everybody's completely bored with all these uh, digital launches, which are too boring and all that. We do our own attempt in a very different way. Maybe it's over the top, but I don't care. That is also the way we go to the fairs. And we have launched, we are ready to launch our newest range, which is behind me here. The introduction, the invitation for this launch is what you're going to see now. You will not see any furniture, but it's just the invitation to participate at the digital launch in a month or so. So if you are interested after watching this trailer of this movie, then you're welcome to subscribe to our digital launch in the near future. So I don't know who is going to show it. I am going to show it. Ah, perfect. Let me know if you can see my screen. Put on the volume high. See. Yes, we can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as as high as it can be, it will be. So. Okay. The night was silent, as silent as it could be. No soul would be seen wandering around in such days. But there, between those warm walls of hope and genius, light was being created. This is a story of brilliancy, resilience, and magic. Real magic. He had finally found it. His greatest creation had come to mind. And so he would go. He grabbed his hat, gathered his wits, and braved the outdoors. Burgess Documentus knew he couldn't keep it to himself. He walked out the door and got on his broom. As he continued, he hopped on his horse and fearlessly rode through the misty forest of proving. Awaiting him would be the chosen boy, one of the few he knew he could trust. And so he'd walk towards him and say, Harry Topper, ha, ha, the boy who lived. Dirkus Documentus, why have you summoned me on such a cold Sunday morning? 
marveled by the greatness of such lines, the genius of such invention, the boys screamed, What an amazing magnificent! Do not speak the words, Topper, said Documentus. <laughs> you two, stop narrating all my words, will you? But sir, then how can the viewer know what a brilliant idea you have found? The people will know. They will know. Curious, you fearless wizards? Join us in our virtual launch and discover how the story unfolds of Harry Topper and the Table of Proven. Awesome. <laughs> that was good. Wow. It was a lot of fun to make it, and we still, uh, next Monday, we start filming again because we have to film the real film now, and the launch will be like a, a the presentation of that film with small, with small um, scenarios where we unfold all the characteristics of this, this new uh, furniture range. So, please subscribe. You will have a lot of fun watching it. When will we be able to share this? We're looking forward to it. Well, actually, um, we are preparing the mailing right now. Um, and the only thing that um, is holding us back now is that we have to finish the patents. We have uh, four utility patents that will be put down. Not only the design patents, but also utility patents for this range four of them and and of course we cannot show anything before all that work is finished and i estimate that in one month but we can already start organizing it and we can already start uh, subscribing to these digital launches but all this information will be shared by by thomas and ashley in the, in the next week how how this is planned how the scenario unfolds and how this can be organized with your customers well as you've got a a, a little bit of time i just wanted to invite you round to where i am <laughs> uh,